right, uh, we are back live at this very special SVK edition as we adjust our mics. Uh, here at the Restaurants Canada show, uh, we have Margot joining us from Technomic. Tech, yeah, Technomic. I did it right. <laughs> you got it right. Um, nailed it, nailed it. And uh, here to talk about more consumer trends and looking at the landscapes. And I think, uh, you know, as we were talking before the show, it's more important than ever to have the best data around your consumers because, um, you know, we may have fewer opportunities. People are maybe going out less than ever. So the expectations are higher and you've got the data that restaurants need to delight their guests. So maybe if you want to start introduce yourself and we'll talk a little bit about Technomic. And we can sure, absolutely. So uh, Technomic is leading food away from home market research uh, company. So we do business and we've been doing this for 55 plus years in the U.S., Canada, and now 23 additional countries around the world. So why do we do that? Well, companies like Cisco and some of the big vendors, think about Coke of this world, or large operators that we were doing custom research in other countries around the world, um, wanted some of that same rigorous insight into the food service guests, the menu, mm. the trends, what's happening in size in the industry, because it is a small world. Yeah. And the other thing that we experience, especially in places like Canada and North America, is that a lot of uh, what's going on around the world finds their way into our markets. So how do we uh, peel, peel it back and, and understand what's happening? So we do that now. Um, I work with uh, predominantly a lot of the companies in Canada, and I have mm -hmm. a lot of clients in the U.S. as well. That's great. And like it's, it's so important that not only do you guys specialize in takeout or food away from home, but uh, like specifically, and which I think is... I think it's more important than ever right because more people are consuming food outside of restaurants and in all different like forms and all different places than ever and um exactly that yeah. so when you think about it uh, so we, we study the industry like from top to bottom so we call commercial restaurants like quick service restaurants full service restaurants we understand that but we also track what's happening at ski resorts or in the in the recreation space right mm -hmm. think about what happened during the pandemic um, your Dave and Buster's of this world, or yeah. Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment, recreation locations. What happened to the hotel industry? So the food that's consumed, both the convention banquet space, as well as the everyday um, restaurants in those spaces. So we really have a good understanding of all the segments. And what does that one consumer do as they travel? So how do they use quick service? How do they use a full service restaurant? What do they do um, when they're maybe at work and they're in their place of business? Hmm. Businesses shut down during the pandemic, and so all of those corporate cafeterias closed shop yep. for a number of years. And in fact, it's one of the areas or segments that continues to lag in the recovery. So quick service restaurants are back on track. Full service restaurants are looking to hit their numbers by this year yep. in terms of traffic sales. And we've had a, a tremendous upsurge. But there's certain places where you and I, as consumers, would have a food service experience. Airlines, think travel. Yeah. Right, so all of that dried up, but now the industry's back on track, and they're suffering from employees and labor. But we're still trying to get a you know a good food service experience at an airport, you know, <laughs> or, we're still trying or to on the that. airplane, or yeah, or on the airplane, <laughs> exactly. Well, I think you know something really interesting is like, I mean, I think everybody knows we talk about it all the time. Like, you know, the landscape's changed, consumers changed, their habits have changed since the pandemic. And you take the idea of like a corporate, you know, a corporate cafeteria that shuts down for two years. They can't, they can just open back up and be like, all right, we're here again, guys. We've got your specials, your Thursday special. And everyone's just like, I don't eat that anymore. Or just, we're not sure. Or yeah, didn't you hear this is, and then there's obviously the, you know, sustainable packaging and all the new requirements coming in. So, um, and to be those operators, yeah. right? So you have to forecast, you might have an employee base. You could be in a corporate tower and in Calgary or Vancouver or Montreal or downtown or the banking sector, yeah. they have employees and they start to bring them back to work. Is it an optional thing? I'm there Monday, Wednesday, works. Friday. Yeah. Now you're the operator, the restaurant operator in that commercial space. You might have a population base of a thousand employees in the tower. Yeah. How many are actually coming? How do you forecast uh, the hours of operation? All of these yeah. things are real challenges. And in fact, uh, Joe Paul, one of our managing principals, he, he spoke yesterday on stage to talk about how challenging it is to get um, for restaurant operators that were in those downtown cores, right? So maybe they were very popular for breakfast and lunch. Well, some of that business dried up, but they've moved to late night for those that are living in those communities. But yeah. how do you switch your operation? Um, and so catering. So right now, businesses are trying to get employees back to work. So it could be premium coffees. I just read today, 
some of these business environments are bringing in baristas. Yeah. You know, they're trying to, how do I offer something to get my employees to know that it's a better, aside from the work environment, well, but it's a great place to come back to. Can I just stop for just one second? Because you think you said two things that I, I don't know if people are linking, but you have the data to link this. It's like your work cafeteria can change because one day a thousand employees are in the office yes. and then it's 200 and then it's 500, then it's a thousand again. So how are you supposed to manage that? But what about all of the businesses or restaurants around that office that also used to function with like five days a week, nine to five crowd, Absolutely. they have the breakfast. It's like, they may not know that the office that they used to serve all the time actually does have 100% capacity on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday now, and then they can react to that. Bingo. And Nailed you it, know, yeah. that's when we think about some of the independent operators, it was the city core that really struggled. So where has the growth and the recovery come from? Yeah. Well, the pandemic took off in the suburbs, for sure, right? It's taken off and those restaurants were prepared for that surge. Mm -hmm. and some of the relocation of the real estate issues, but that's a whole separate conversation because restaurants are moving, but those downtown core restaurants have really struggled. Yeah. Um, so breakfast and lunch day part, but also populations. And they're one step removed from say the building uh, or the employer location that knows what the policy is. You know, they're, they're really on this receiving end of, of the notice. Yeah. So, so one of the ways that um, some of the clients we're talking to is they're trying to incentivize employees to come back they're adding catering programs. And that's a way for an operator to also respond to say, you might have had steady traffic flow coming in off the streets at breakfast and lunch, but now how do you pull your stuff together? So you go in and you market to the businesses in your area to say, hey, we can do snack, we can do a lunch catering, we can do, you know, what do you need us to do? And how do you need us to support you and the employees to be back into this space? Yeah, and um, you know, looking at this, by the way, incredible facts and quick stats about the industry provided by Technomic. I've learned so much just before the show. <laughs> but you talked about this idea of these trends like increasing like now versus say 2019. And one of the ideas that the routine meal has gone up as in like people plan it on their way to work and not. And so we just talked, everything we just talked about, making sure like, how do you know as a restaurant that that is that the routine for this employees now is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or that so you can, so people are, are already making it more part of their routine but it's hard to staff your restaurant and be 100% of the time if the flow fluctuates so much. So it's so just looking at these data points, working with a company like you guys, they can they can draw this conclusion and say, hey, this is how we need to staff our restaurant. Um, yeah, the, the new normal, we keep talking about it. Nobody knows what that is yet. So all of, of our routines were disrupted, except for let's say first responders. But then we started to go back to school. We started to go back to work and the kids are going to hockey now. So those patterns of routine meals. And when you couldn't go to the store or a restaurant to get a food service meal, if you're a parent or an individual, you have to plan your, your path, right? Yeah. So we call this path to purchase work. We do a lot of work in this space, but you need to know where you're gonna stop for snacks or you're gonna get your meals. And so now it's more planned. That's positive and it's also negative. So mm -hmm. if you are an operator and you had daily specials or you really start to fight for that traffic. So all the restaurants open back up almost simultaneously and everybody wants the same consumer. The consumer's a little hesitant to pop in or to have an unplanned visit. Hey friends, let's let's meet up afterwards and go out for a drink here. You don't know if they're open or what they're offering or if they're staffed. So there's a little more hesitancy. Um, I think that may come around a little bit, but we have another year to see how things uh, to flesh that out. But that's exactly the point. Yeah. The occasion drivers. So why, what was the purpose of your visit? So Technomic projected for 2023 that one of the biggest occasions to increase and come back will be celebratory. Yeah. So we didn't celebrate weddings and anniversaries and birthdays and promotions and graduation. We didn't celebrate that. Yep. So we are looking to see some of these signals, except the challenge of course for consumers is that the price of all of this has gone up tremendously. So you're going to get a little push pull while the, the market figures this out. Yep. But there are still opportunities here to drive that special occasion purpose or a visit. Well, I think one of the one of the big factors that you guys are the primary reasons driving restaurant occasions was like uh, the need to connect. And I think that's really where um, you combine this this need that people have and you say, hey, well, you can connect over all these old occasions that and restaurants need to promote that. They need to promote the idea that, hey, did you think about actually celebrating the promotion here? Because like birthdays, sure, anniversary is okay. Everybody remembers. Let's go to a nice meal. But 
knowing that this knowing that this is what consumers are looking for restaurants can take advantage of that and start suggesting ideas of like hey do you ever consider like let's talk about the promotion or the end of the quarter thing or you know if you know it's end of quarter in general and you're in the financial district or whatever you can make those okay let's celebrate exactly. the end of the quarter right exactly and, and think about how you construct your menu how do you do your marketing so yeah. think about shareables Right. These are things that we do when you know, it's a little, a little dicey post COVID. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you had any interesting points. Oh, no, the we're shareables. still seeing okay, it. But yeah. you know, creating opportunities to say, hey, we're a place to come and yeah. connect with other people. So it could be just friends, it could be relatives, it could be anybody that it is. But what does that environment look like? Mm -hmm. Is there inviting? Is um, So a lot of operations actually refurbished during the pandemic. Yep. So they're clean. So welcome your guests back. We've got something new here for you to come in and see. You'll see a lot of uh, restaurants advertising their people and, and the service element. So that's a real key piece. Mm -hmm. People are tired of doing things for themselves or going to the grocery store and across the counter, I'm going to pick up a roast chicken or something like that. So now, how do you welcome them back with an ambiance, with an atmosphere, with staff and a menu that says, this is going to be a fun place to come. Yeah. So do you have fun drinks? Do you have fun foods You know that people want to experiment? And it's a, it's a gentle balance between that comfort of familiar, but with a twist. Mm -hmm. Because you're tired of the same pizza that you were ordering on delivery or the takeout app or what you know. So you're looking for yeah. something new and, and trendy. Yeah. And that speaks to connecting. And it's funny, I was even talking to my wife about it the other day where it was like, you know, we used to do like a happy hour where it's like after work, we get together, we have a drink at the house and we just like, well, hey, how was your day and all this? And then we had our like special meals we make for each other. And I was telling him, I was just like, man, like I want to, I want to spend this time with you, but like, and it's not you, it's us, it's like the routine. I'm like, we need to find, I'm like, we need to find a way to spice it up or to basically like, you know, let's uh, like, like supplement like our little happy hour by saying, hey, maybe we'll actually go and get like a fancy bottle of wine, or maybe we'll actually order like a cool appetizer or something, because it's not us. It's not. It's just the fact that we've been in this routine so long that we need to, you know, I think everybody can find a way. Whether you're an office building, you're a family, you know, like. You know, the pizza, we used to do the Friday pizza night, which used to be fun. That was the takeout we would do or from a small town. But let's just say that, you know, I could be a little sick of pizza right now, you know, because that's what used to be special is now became the norm because we needed it and we loved it. But now everybody's looking for that. And like I said, I can see it on your stats right here. The need to satisfy. The need to like, satisfy. That's why people craving. are going out. Craving is number one, for sure. But, then, you know, need to connect is number two. And it's also, you've been connecting with the same person, theoretically. Yeah over the course of the pandemic. So it's also need to connect with a broader base of people. Yeah. We're human, we're socially driven. Yep. And so connecting with friends, neighbors, relatives, co-workers. And so that's part of that message too in the business piece, which is to find a reason to come back and connect with co-workers. And employees are saying, well, we're connecting online. We see each other on Zoom or Teams meetings or whatever that is. So you need to find something about the experience that makes it fun to connect in person yeah and once you get them off the couch or out of their house you know and people get that face to face it, it really drives an energy i mean we even see it with the staff with these restaurants you know we struggle to get employees back to the restaurants to work yeah. as an industry but you can ask anybody that was in the industry they love the energy they love working in these environments they're happy to be back even in their workplace to connect and they're getting a lot of that social interaction and, and I think it's so important to realize, like I, I use the example of my wife and I's routine, but I mean, the, the relationship between the restaurant and their and their, their average guest or consumer, they're like, you know, maybe throughout the pandemic, they've ordered more than ever from them. But then they're like, well, if I'm going to go out, I need to, I'm going to go somewhere that's different. And we're now competing with the pe people can be, you know, sitting in front of their like nice flat screen TVs that are cheaper than ever. They've got the comfort of their own home and they can order their favorite food right to their couch. So you actually are competing with, I can get good food, right at home so it's not just about the food it's not just about that it's about That's the experience right. exactly. and what i was what i've been you know pushing on the tech show is this idea of like those in-person unique experiences right whether it's like i mean all you can eat is an example or like the tapanyaki stuff or the like the idea that you go and do like fondue or something that like Restaurants, I think, need to create that in-person experience that's unique they can't get in the home because right now you can get everything at a restaurant at a home or sorry, you can get well the food parts, right? Yes, and, and think about it. So ordering on the app could be the routine meal. So instead of just you know hitting hitting your breakfast drive-through or your afternoon, whatever, as part of the routine, 
part of the routine meal occasion is now order on an app and have it come into your home. Yep. So, so even that has a bit of a fatigue factor and we want to move past that. So that's again about the dining out piece. Um, yeah, we just did some work and, and analyzed, you know, what were some of the differences, those usage attitude drivers behind why we eat, what we eat, when we eat, how we eat. And there was a really interesting piece because when the pandemic first hit, people were thinking community building, I'm going to eat healthy, you know, and, and we'll call them health enthusiasts. We have eater architects and technology, yeah. health enthusiasts, people that are going to go and we're going to get fit and we're going to fight off this infection and we're going to do all that stuff. Well, it peaked a little bit, but in the last year, that's backed right off. And so um, the reason when you're eating out, if you're going to go out for special, if you're indulging, it's uh, what we call them affluent socializers or food service hobbyists. There are people that want that experience and that has remained very strong. And that's part of food service. It's fundamental yeah. to that experiential piece. And we're going to see that. The other thing though, that's interesting is that um, we have another group of consumers called habitual and matures. So they're a little more price sensitive, but they also have established a routine meal. Maybe they couldn't go to the grocery store or they were left alone to eat by themselves. Mm -hmm. So they want to go out on a fairly regular, consistent basis. Um, they're going to be a little more, a little less risky, maybe yeah. a little less innovative, but uh, they are going to be those trusted guests. And, and you mentioned this. So the operator needs to know, have you lost some of those people before the pandemic or as they come back? Do you have a relationship with them? The whole tech world, I'll talk your world here, has gone explosive with uh, digital apps. How yeah. do we track the consumer? How many times do they come back? I have an app now for my skiing, and I realize at one point in time, they know when I'm on the hill, what runs I'm doing, what's happening, and they know more about me than I know about me when I'm visiting their location. Yeah, but what I think is most important about that is the we are collecting more data than ever, but we don't have, but, but how do you apply this data to your restaurant? Most people don't have somebody that says, I'm going to, you know, weekly or daily, I'm going to take all this data and put it in, turn it into actionable insights. That's what you guys do. Oh, we have to distill it down because you're yeah. right, it's a big data dump. Well, the fact that I was able, like I've been in this industry for a long time and I've learned so much in five minutes of reading this, <laughs> this is what restaurants need. And so I, I, I think a lot of them are being told all this, right? They're being told, yeah, you need to know your customers, you need all this data, you should, you should use all these, you know, mobile ordering apps, go app it, um, you know, to collect this data but they don't know how to apply it. And that's where you guys can come in and say, not only like we created some ideas by bringing disparate data points together about like going to the office and not only the restaurants in the office, but beside the office. And you know, you can't, that can take hours of, of analysis for the average person to take a look at their food trends and then realize, oh, I'm actually seeing a peak on these certain days. And I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, they told me that they go to work on these days. You guys shorten it, you cut through that. Yeah, we try. You we try, try, yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you another area, though, where that really uh, rings true. And, and I think you mentioned this maybe when we kicked off the show is yeah. that if you're not sure and you just listen to social media or buzz, you're not really sure what's a trend, what's a fad, and what's just noise. Yeah. So we have to distill that down. So I'm going to use plant-based, right? Plant-based exploded. And Technomic tracks menu trends. And we track them quarterly. So we're also tracking pricing trends around that right now. We're seeing what's happening with menu, um, menu items moving up and down and how that's impacting, but let's, let's just take plant-based. So plant-based was on fire. It continued throughout um, the pandemic, but we track plant-based across it from plant-based milks and your coffee to your lunch items. What does this look like versus vegetarian versus vegan? And we can see what's happening here. So here's my question to you. Do you think plant-based foods on menu are increasing, decreasing or holding steady? I would probably say holding steady. Um, now, we had Beyond Meat on here earlier today, and I would say my opinion about it before this morning was one thing, and then after uh, after eating some of their food now, where you said we just launched this 60 days ago, he said it's moving faster than ever right now. So I'm definitely gonna take a second look at plant-based, but in my opinion, I feel like they might've just been kind of staying where they are. Well, they actually decreased. In some okay. categories, they've decreased. Some, they've held uh, it together. Mm -hmm. But price points and supply chain sort of overrode but that. But I wasn't expecting it to increase just because you're fighting that, you know, you're trying to introduce a new product to a new market. At the same time, you're trying to keep the lights on when yeah. you yeah. can't so, take those risks. So there were some operational pain points there for yeah. sure in the price, right? But the price of 
non-plant-based foods have also gone up. So, True. So, so there's that piece there. But at the end of the day, operators have to figure out what they do. But I guess what they want to know is, what do my guests want? Yeah. And that's what we help uncover. And we can see what's happening. So um, on that plant-based, how do you serve it? Is it unique or are you replacing items that might be covered by a non-plant-based? Yeah. Let's use a burger or a chicken nugget. Um, last year at the National Restaurant Association show in Chicago, uh, the explosion of plant-based seafood was everywhere. Okay. Eh, we haven't seen it so much here in Canada. Yeah. But, um, you know, just, just an example of, you know, are we actually leading with this? And what we got back from work we do with our operators and, and research is to say, in Canada, a lot of Canadians want simple plant-based. They want, veg- you know, they want vegetables. They want local. Yeah. So where did this, and if you track the trajectory, right, where did some of the plant-based come from and is it Canadian and how does that feed into another story for those operators? But that being said, it tastes great. It really does. Mm-hmm. So will it come back and what does it see? And I guess Beyond Meat told you they're taking off? Well, just that they're like, they've seen like, I mean, they're just innovating faster and faster and faster. So the, the difference between like, for example, when we talked, I said, yeah, I'm a big texture person. And it, you guys did not have texture when I tried you guys. You came out years ago and they're just like, now we do. And he's like, and we're innovating so fast that this is 60 days old on the market now. This one was only a few months ago. And he's like, I'm convincing guys in you know do New York pizzerias to use this pepperoni now. And I'm like, that's amazing. And it's funny about the seafood because, I, I mean, I don't know everything about that industry. But, I mean, a lot of it's white fish, like, mixed in with flavor, right? You get, like, the you know, fake crab, fake whatever. I feel like plant-based is like, you know, you have that one flavor of plant-based and you can make it taste like any seafood you want. Um, so I could definitely see that that parallel. In Canada, I don't know why we, you know, maybe we have more access to fresh fish, but it's uh, <laughs> well, interesting. Lots of different reasons, but yeah, hmm. cost, cost is part of the parcel of it for sure. But anyway. Well, how does the cost match up right now? Like if you're, it's like, so it's, is the plant-based, is it, is it the same? Is it more expensive? Is it nominal at this point? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, I suppose it depends what you're looking at. Yeah. Right I'll take eggs, for example, right now. So last year, plant-based eggs were very big at the show. Yeah. Where we're at today is avian flu has hit and wiped out, you know, flocks, thousands and thousands right. in Canada and the U.S. everywhere else. So the cost of eggs, if you go to the grocery store, if you're running a restaurant, have gone through the roof. Um, how do plant-based eggs compare now to natural eggs? Probably still a bit more expensive, but that gap is closed. Right. Um, but the cost to feed your animals and, you know, whether it's beef or chicken or pork or some of those traditional meats, um, for sure, the gap is closed and into all things that have risen um, from that So it's just a matter of understanding your consumers, understanding what they actually want. And yes. if plant-based is an alternative, either for health reasons or for costs, because it can now potentially be closer. Or if, if you're substituting it out. So there's a yeah. small percentage of the market will go for that. You still have a high percentage of people that want things with beets and carrots and squash and alternatives um we have seen a a growth in the plant-based cheeses so you've got a lot of pizza companies right pizza in canada is huge huge right everybody loves pizza that's what we're eating this morning all plant-based cheese plant-based pepperoni it's all plant-based everything right fantastic um but plant-based cheeses are continuing to grow and become more available and think about what's happened in canada so we had last year for the first time Two CDC, so the Canadian uh, Dairy Commission, raised the price, the wholesale price of milk in February, which is the annual price, and September. I can't remember when that last happened, but that's right. because the cost of getting that product to market. So, you know, uh, did plant based increase at the same cadence? I don't know. It's, it's really quite honestly, we need to have a, a math degree now between <laughs> the influence of of what's going on with some of the commodities, some of the grain, or whether it could be a corn or an oil shortage soybeans or wheat or because of geopolitical uh, we track consumer and producer price indexes and they've all been going up at double digit rates so it's it's really hard to find something that hasn't been impacted right but i think i think you've kind of identified that they don't fluctuate the same it's not like you know a barrel of oil and then it stays the same it's like you can have situations where there are you know whether it's a flu avian flu that could make eggs now a better alternative or more uh, mm-hmm. cost effective and I think if restaurants start looking at these different types of, say, plant-based options and alternatives, as food costs go up, they might have the ability to sub things out. And if they start now, um, they might find out that their consumers want it just because, yeah, this tastes just the same and I know it's healthier and I can get it for a similar price. Like, great. For sure. For sure. And, or yeah. even between the proteins. Mm. So, funny enough, um, when restaurant industry took a bit of a tumble, do you know what happened? Was Think about lobster. Think about some of those seafood 
that was available that would, you would only get at a restaurant. Yeah, it doesn't travel well, for example. Mussels, yeah. oysters, shellfish, some of that other Experience-based food. Right. Yeah. Um, but, so they weren't selling at a restaurant, so the price actually came down in retail grocery stores because of supply and demand. So what operators are always struggling to balance, which is, you know, I need proteins, I need to have a good menu that's going to attract my guests, but even switching between the proteins. So even to take off a poultry item and put an egg on it, it still might be more cost-effective, even though the price of eggs have gone up. Yeah. still might be more cost effective than the poultry, I mean, it's theory, or pork or beef or, or whatever it may be. So the switching between the proteins and getting that balance, some plant-based, some not, some just a more cost effective uh, source of the protein. Yeah, and it just it's just funny about being able to sub things out too, because um, my wife and I actually went the opposite direction when the pandemic hit, is we didn't order takeout. I think we ordered takeout like four times in the first six months. And because we were just cooking all, we were like, oh, let's cook more. We'll have more experiences Eat together. Entertainment. There you go. Eat entertainment, right? Our condo is like we had our TV living room. It was in our kitchen, basically. So it was like a great experience. But then we got tired of like, okay, only so many new dishes, only so many new things. But, you know, if it was today, I could be like, hey, let's try to stuff some of these plant-based items in here. Let's mix it up or let's change because we just got into that routine. So, um, so I mean, restaurants can be doing this right now. I mean, we're on the plant-based topic. Like I said, I was blown away this morning. Like, you know, changed my whole oh. perspective about how good this stuff is now. So it's something the restaurants can look at immediately and it can help protect costs sometimes or at least be an alternative that gets more people coming in because they want those choices. Mm -hmm. Let's use coffee as an example. So everybody yeah. bought and ordered Amazon, you know, every type of cooking equipment and machine and upgraded their coffee experience because they weren't going out. Uh, but they get a little tired of making their coffee. And so even, even quick service restaurants, take your basic restaurants, have really upped their game to deliver a more of a barista experience. Yeah. They're um, differentiating with different milks, oat milk, almond milk, uh, macadamia nut milk. You know, Some of these things are starting to grow and flavors and combinations because they're trying to get guests back yeah. into the restaurants. And so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a struggle because some people got into a bit of a pattern and a routine, and they haven't experienced the fatigue. They said, "Wow, I save a lot of money, you know, if I don't do this." But uh, yeah, no. So we're seeing we're seeing the evolution, and, and there's another play there that we're, we have yet to see play out. You know, air fryers went crazy, but are oh. people still air frying today? I mean, I I got in late, so I am, and I love it. <laughs> um, I'm making so many I'm air frying before I came here, but uh, but I was really late to that. I was really late to that trend. Uh, but it's actually interesting that it's so cool or refreshing that like even after all these years coffee is still something that we're like we can compete on this we can innovate on this it's profitable but we now need to but we need to keep you know keep trying new things and yes like, and and i think restaurants are doing a really good job the plastic band so making the conversion to different cups yeah different uh, which are important to guests you know uh, because for a while there we stopped refilling you bring your own cup and tumbler which was environmentally you know, sound practice to do and then COVID hit. So, you know, it's really challenging for the operator to stay on top of everything that the consumer wants. And again, yeah. what's a fad, what's a trend? So we have to, we monitor things monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, annual, and we try to distill, okay, what's moving, what's not moving. Plant-based isn't going away, but there's a lot of other things that um, yeah. we're seeing are exciting. One of the cool, so you're saying like, uh, looking at this beautiful fact sheet again, like some of these, these orange uh, boxes have some interesting metrics. And one of the ones that caught my eye was the fact that these health enthusiasts, the fact that they've decreased or they're uh, using food service at least once a week has decreased by 12 percentage points. So we talk about plant-based, we talk about choice, we talk about providing like people the nutritional information more. But where, how do you see restaurants like addressing this with you know everything that you've seen in the industry like that's that's interesting that they're not dining out as much but they're the ones most conscious about what food they're having mm -hmm. versus maybe an enthusiast or some of their drivers have changed so you know someday you can be going along and the real purpose for your you know some of driver for your occasion was to be consistent or speed or convenience and you will yeah. pay because you're balancing you're juggling the balls but now as you're getting older, which is typical in the population, we start to be more health aware. Yeah. And so we're gonna make decisions, conscious decisions, about what we eat, where we eat, how we eat, with health in mind. So people may have thought, well, maybe I'm eating healthy at home, or maybe I wasn't eating healthy at home, I'm gonna exercise, or maybe it's they're moving to, I need to treat myself. So back to that experience and connect. And so health is not as much of a driver for some people dining out as it was say three years ago. Mm -hmm not gone away it's not going to not go away and i'm sure it'll pop back again as we all 
uh, you know, reestablish ourselves in our routines. But yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're an aging population. So health is a really important factor and it, it, it's just a matter of what health. And I know that like, oh, we were talking about this earlier today, I think, but it's easier to prepare a healthy meal at home sometimes because it's like, I know what's going into this or I want to chop up some veggies and I know that it's going to be healthy versus the idea of, and they probably got used to doing that a lot more over the past, uh, you know, a couple of years when they've been at home. So it's, it's scarier. So maybe rest, so restaurants need to understand that they need to make sure that like health is one of their, one of their driving factors. If that's what they're, if they, if they're targeting this, you know, these consumers, right? Yeah. Great, great point. So they, um, it's always there and all the big chains understand and follow yeah. this. But if we think about that segment called fast casual, so mm. fast casual operators could be chopped leaf, um, it, it, lots of ethnic cuisines, but where you're, you're in front of them putting your food together. So yeah. even a subway could I want peppers and lettuce and tomatoes or onions or this, or I'm going to forego the cheese or the aioli sauce, whatever that piece is making it happen. Well, that fast casual segment shrunk it, 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 very much so in Canada. So it went down to 3% of our sales last year. Interesting. Yeah. Within the whole piece because we weren't allowed to interact and make that happen. And so you're not having that opportunity when you're doing a delivery yeah. or a drive through, which right now, especially in quick service restaurants, 55% of the occasion, you're ordering 55% of the time inside the unit. Before, it used to be 70%. Yeah. So three years ago, it was 70%. So what's increased? drive through has increased. Um, digital ordering and uh, that piece is um, increased. So how, how you order and engage with that brand. So that, that freshness, that healthy choice, exactly making my build, that opportunity is is gone away a little bit for some people. And now yeah. here's the question, if you're used to ordering on the app, now I'm going to use McDonald's as a really good example here because you can pick your toppings and add or plus, but it's on a kiosk. You still have to go into the unit to do that. Yeah. Are you going to do that in the drive through Not sure. Oh, man, well, you go to the drive through and, like, I mean, now the great thing is you can sit in the parking lot, you can order what you want on the app, and then you get to the drive through window and you just tell them your number. Because, I mean, even me going to McDonald's, I was like, I mean, like, you sit there, and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, one more car, one more car. Well, what am I going to get? Am I going to get the Big Mac combo again? And then you get there, and you're just like, what do you want? Oh, the Big Mac combo. Ah, damn, I wanted to get something different. Right. It's easy. It's That's easy. the routine meal. Yeah. It's the, um, and we see this a little bit uh, in recessionary times. But you're going to order what's familiar and not go too, too crazy with this stuff. Because, oh, am I going to pay extra for that? You know, yeah. am I gonna, are they going to top it, or how are they going to build it? Or does the person putting my meal together know what they're doing? Whereas if you're in a fast casual and you're inside the unit and they're assembling in front of you, you can pick it. Oh, you can see the tomatoes are green, are red, not green. Or yeah. um, you know, what does the um, lettuce look like? Or what else do they have? Guacamole. Oh, that's fresh guacamole. You, you can see it with your eyes. And you can make that choice and make a health conscious choice. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you talked fast casual and I hadn't thought about it until you brought it up. And it makes perfect sense where fast casual is trying to, you know, it's the middle ground between going to a sit down restaurant and, but, and having like a really good meal or a more, you know, involved meal than something like uh you know just quick service but that that category didn't really exist anymore because you either went out and you wanted that full meal experience or you just wanted something convenient so i'd be curious to see if people and maybe it's not maybe it's not the food it's more of the the other reasons of the need to connect the need to like um even keeping it simple well being more than quick service we might see that rise again but that's interesting to see that it's not enough of an in-person experience, I think, to justify like the extra time or the extra cost. Well, oh, it's got to deliver on, yes, the, in, the, the customization. So customization yeah. was important before the pandemic. Yeah. During the pandemic, it sort of dropped down in priority. You know, I'm just happy to get food. Mm. <laughs> you know, I'm happy to get something that tastes, did it come hot? Yeah. Did the hot food come hot? Did the cold food come hot? So, yeah. uh, cold. So our priorities change and that's really how some of what we accept and consider a good experience, right? Good value. And that's kind of what things are shifting is the experience that you had before the pandemic is different than you had during and now different afterwards. What does that cost? And what, so, so we drive, if we're restaurant operators uh, or guests, we drive value through a great experience. So it was a lot of fun. The server was fantastic, very knowledgeable, suggested a great wine or knew what was in the bill that had nuts and didn't have nuts. Or was it through the food? Was it delicious? Was it exciting, innovative, something that I hadn't imagined? Or, um, you know, what were those attributes? And one of yeah. one of the value attributes is price. But as we've come through the pandemic, price is now rising, right? So the value. So there's an exchange there. It's hard right? to compete on something. That, to feel value. Yeah. So uh, 
let's a cup of coffee that you used to get at your favorite or a beer that you'd get at your restaurant. Now, if the beer's gone up a dollar between government taxes and cost of living, Boy, yeah. is it worth you to go out to have the beer on premise to get a beer and be with your friends? Maybe it is for the buck, right? You're happy to pay that, that because you're getting value through the experience or value through that local brew at the craft group pub, yeah. whatever it may be. However, if you are a quick service operator or a full service operator that's not changing up your menu and it's the same thing and the price is going up, your guests are noticing it. And if you're not delivering on the other attributes that are important for their visit, then you're going to lose out over time. Mm-hmm. So we're getting back to going out with spending, but consumers are going to be discriminating with their tastes, not only in terms of the food they order, but where they go to get that experience. Yeah, and, and we talked about it at the start, and it's been a pretty consistent theme of just like people have more choice than ever. And they're going out less than ever. So it, you really have to delight them and you really have to show them something special yes. to get them in your doors or to get them to order. Um, now, we are at Restaurants Canada. And I mean, I, so someone who has their finger on the pulse before they got here, <laughs> have you seen anything at the show that's either surprising or that you were expecting? Or what have you seen that uh, might be kind of people should pay attention to while they're here? Um, I, nothing really surprising new because I, I see a lot of it. It means you're yeah. doing your job, obviously. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but what I will say, some observation so here the tech um the tech section has expanded Mm -hmm. so there's more options there to operate efficiently so front of house back of house you know i'm seeing more of that what i really like that i've seen is the evolution i don't want i know you've talked to your previous guest about sustainability but the eco eco clustering of options so from packaging to food recovery that's really great to see that streaming through yeah We're, we're very socially aware here um um, nothing really shocking. But there's lots of equipment here, but nothing new that I, I hadn't seen before. Now, that said, I, I'll be fair. There's about a third of the show floor I haven't intimately walked. So I'm, I'm looking for a couple of new and exciting things, and, and I, I'm sure they're here. Oh, yeah. Well, there's lots here. There's something for everybody. And, and uh, I think it's interesting when it comes to sustainability, and you talked about, like, like limiting food waste and, like, food and recovering and being able to recover certain things. And it's like I always think that people forget that there's three hours in recycling, Right. There's the reduce. Like everyone's all about like recycle. Oh, let's recycle this. That's great. But the reduce and reuse aspect is something that I generally try to focus on in my life. So can I reuse this? Can I save this container? Yeah. You know, sometimes I save too many boxes or containers. I'll have to get rid of a couple. But the amount of times I'm able to grab those. And so it's very cool. You made the point of saying that these people are kind of banding together now because they're getting more than just, you know, more than just a straw company. I'm doing all the packaging now. And then we're partnering up with, you know, whether it's like Absolutely. Smart recycling Absolutely. and waste uh, services. So very cool. I can't think of who the operator is, but uh, we have a global practice and an expert. And he posted a operator. It was an Asian operator. And so we talked about value and price. So operators were taking price. And we're, we're at the threshold right now. We're, yes, they're, are going to stop. They're reducing their frequency or they're going to make mm. something else at home. So between the combination of food waste and price value, this operator actively reduced portion size as a means as a business strategy to be effective so people are throwing away things and also the price point so they led with that they yeah. put it out there we're going to reduce our portion sizes and here's the price so you're getting a good you know theoretical value feel that um, esoterically they're doing the right thing yeah because there's less going out or less pack you know less food actually ending up at the end of the day in their local garbage front of the house so but they've led with that strategy what and like I actually kind of love it. I mean, there's certain things that I don't like about it. Because like, I remember a very specific QSR that I used to go to all the time that they decided to just not change their price. Then they made their packaging smaller. And then and then they started increasing their price. And it was like, I get the trend, but I'm curious about the data you've seen on, like, I can see Americans not liking this very much. As in like, <laughs> we're going to reduce your portion size. And you're going to pay the same amount of money. But as someone who can say, well, I don't want, I still want the same meal, but I don't want to pay extra money. And yeah, I do normally have some of the leftover. So that concept of just like, I'm sure you can maybe have these, the upside selling if you want, but just saying we're going to try to reduce portions and if this is good enough, great. You well, know? It, it ticks a few boxes for a few different reasons. And I, I don't want to generalize, but I would suggest that mm-hmm. um, there are some Americans that plan that routine meal to go out and have dinner and have a portion that's so big that they're going to plan for the leftovers yeah. so that they're going to plan to have that at lunch. For the next day yeah that's part of their dining out strategy whereas i can't see that happening as much in canada 
you know, having enough food on the plate left over, it's food waste. Yeah. So maybe it gets eaten, maybe it doesn't, but there's also a package it has to go in. If you're not consuming it at the restaurant, it has to go in a package that you have to take home. Which is extra cost for the restaurant, especially. It is very that. costly for the restaurant, especially okay. now that the restaurants aren't using single use plastic. So they're moving to compostable materials and some other more sustainable materials for take up packaging. And they in and of themselves are, hmm. can be more costly. But like, and so that's just a, such an incredible insight. And it's, and I mean, you identified the fact that if we just reduce our portions and have less food waste, there's a literal cost to that container. And maybe it's also something that like, they might not come back the next day for lunch because they have leftovers. So it's like, if you can just reduce your waste, reduce your portion size, you might increase your visits and you're also reducing the cost of the dining experience because you're not having to give that package, which is probably more expensive than ever now, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and ask chefs or, or Jay sitting beside you or, or some others, how many of them actually design a meal that is meant to be cooked in a restaurant in terms yeah. of all the quality that goes into it, packaged up, refrigerated, reheated the next day? So, you know, what does it say about your brand? I you know some operators in certain brands may really enjoy this as part of, hey, it's really yeah. better the second day. Um, or would you rather pissed, yeah. have them come back in or have another occasion for the week with something that was the right size? You almost don't want to send them home with the food because you're like, you're going to love it in the restaurant. And then you're going to have it a couple of days later and be like, oh, it's not as good as I remember. And it's no, like, it's not as hot. They won't it, make the relationship. You might not be dressed or topped or prepared or served the same way no. or your hot item has been mixed with your cold item. Yeah. So, so um, how do restaurateurs interact with you? Like, if, for example, people listen to this right now. They're like, I need some of this insight. This would be great. Like, what's the normal engagement with you? Do they go to your website? Do they have you have consultants? Maybe you could kind of yeah, break that down question. a little bit. So we have um, a number of really self-serve tools. Yeah. We call our platform Ignite. And so I would say majority of operators really start it with our menu data. So what's happening, what are flavors, ingredients, preparations, healthy claims. We track healthy claims on menu. So is it about keto right now or is it about gluten-free? Or is it about dairy free? Or is it about plant based? Yeah. You know, we, we track with statistical numbers what's happening. So you can stay on top of that. Um, and, and lots of insights. So it can be a resource for inspiration. It can help you with pricing. Mm -hmm. If you're an operator, it can help you with the pricing. Um, and we do this with beverages too. And of course, adult beverages. So think cocktails. How do we create cocktails? You know, we saw this when full service restaurants had alcohol free cocktails and fizzies that now go to any quick service restaurant and you have refreshers or drinks that are multiple flavors in a cold format that's two bucks or three bucks and you have it through the drive through so mm. real evolution of some of that we call that sort of a, a flavor life cycle so we, we work an awful lot with operators on that for chain operators we track very robust some of this consumer data here but we're also tracking their guest experience across almost a hundred different attributes at 55 chain restaurant brands in Canada. So on an annual basis, like 25,000 consumer survey, but things like, are you dining in? Are you dining out? Is what's more important to you? So here's another point. So before the pandemic, the three most important attributes a restaurant operator needs to deliver on was food taste and flavor, food quality and service. Yeah. <laughs> During the pandemic, that changed a little bit. So some of those dropped. So crept into not from the top five to the top three was dishware was was the restaurant cleanliness and dishware and serving right. ware cleanliness that became a priority. Makes sense. So that's yeah. still in the it's still in the top five, but it's moved out. Right. And think about back when you could order a pizza and it'd be free if you couldn't get it in thirty minutes. Or the drive-through wars, where the major chains were saying, "We can get you through this drive-through in a million, you know, a minute, ten seconds." Yeah. Speed of service dropped way off during the pandemic. They had no choice. We had no choice. Yeah, you're People adding, you're adding so patient. many steps of service, right? But guess what? Now in the top three, order accuracy, because we've gone to digital apps and takeout and delivery, and now the consumer frustration is, I, I didn't get what I ordered. Yeah. And that's part of the experience. So. We track all of these attributes from service to cleanliness to what's on the food to tech and Wi-Fi. So that's a, especially for the younger consumers. Yeah. Gen Z, right? They're very tech enabled. They want to oh, have man, a good yeah. experience. It's the and first question my nephew's asked me. It's like, did you guys change the Wi-Fi password? I can't get on. <laughs> I need the Wi-Fi. Okay, cool. Also good to see you. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we track all of that. And that really helps them stay on top of what's most important to the guests now. And who is that guest that's dining out? So who's going to quick service restaurants, who's going to full service restaurants. So we can really unpack yeah. a lot of that. And we're answering really interesting questions for some brands that operate across the country. So maybe their sales are better in one region than another. Why is that? Well, we can unpack and look at it geographically and say, you know what, your scores over here for service in this province are not so good compared to here. 
oh, okay, we can help them problem solve that way and, and see opportunities for other areas. Mm -hmm. So that's the consumer piece. And then I would say um, our, our sort of third pillar is industry, uh, sizing, the top players, the news feed. And so a lot of, we interact with a lot of chains and distributors and suppliers in that space, what yep. we call our Ignite company or industry tool. It's very complementary to the menu tool. But that's really those three. And then, of course, we do custom consumer research every month, all the time. Right. And I just love that you kind of, um, I think a really important point is, is this a trend? Is this a fad? Is this signal? Is this noise? Right. And that's where you you have to kind of, people don't know. So they can come to you and they can find out, should I, you know, start buying a bunch of cronuts? You know, like, is that going to stick sticking around, you know? And you just don't know. So it's, uh, it's very exactly. cool. Um, I don't know how much longer we're supposed to be on here, but I know we've had a pretty great talk, and I really appreciate you coming and sharing all your insights. Guys. Well, it's been a lot of fun, Chris. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to share with the group? No, I, I think that's it. I, I know it's a great show. I actually want to hit the floor and, and get to some of those booths that I haven't had a chance to see. And uh, um, it's just been a lot of fun. We always like to be, Technomic always likes to participate in the SVK network, and, and glad to be here. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. And everybody needs to go check out Technomic. If you're not doing this, if you're not looking at this data, you're not looking at these trends, this is how you can get started. And it's more important than ever. Um, so well, thank you so much for coming. We'll help you get there next. You know, exactly. we'll answer that for you. What's next? Perfect. All right. Do we have outro music? Let's do it.